Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in again to another episode of Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. Uh, we have a fun uh, episode today. If you guys recently caught the episode, because by the time... So we do, we do everything in advance, uh, because I'm not popular enough to do lives. But uh, if you guys recently checked out some of the cool videos we did with our recent uh, on-location videos, uh, we have a really cool guest with us. We have... Jonathan of Jonathan's Reptiles. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, we're okay. Tired. Forgot how time zones work. E. Yes. Jet lag's a real thing. Uh, yeah, as I'm just now discovering a week later. But Especially when you come from a land where the sun is up all the time. Yeah, I think that kind of messed me up a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it takes some getting used to for sure. I bet. So, um, I guess we can kind of get right into that. So, are you originally from Alaska, or? I'm not born there, but I've been here my whole life. I was here before my first birthday, so. That means. Not born, but definitely raised Alaska. Yeah, I think you can claim native, I, I think so. Yes, I think I can. There's a lot of Coloradans that may or may not be offended by that statement, but I think that's okay. That's all right. Um, so how long have you been interested in keeping reptiles and kind of how did we get rolling into stuff? So my parents brought home my first Burmese python when I was three years old. She was just a little hatchling Mm -hmm. and she was with us until my senior year of high school. Oh, wow. So beautiful albino Burmese female named Nagaina and she was with us for a long time. And so it was kind of like the family dog, but not a dog. And we had a variety of other critters throughout my childhood and then when I moved out on my own it was very difficult to put my finger on what was missing in my life Mm -hmm. until I held my first snake after moving out and I was like that's it (laughs) missing and then I told myself that I couldn't go back to not having reptiles in my life so I got myself a boa constrictor and then from there I had a small collection of reptiles which turned into you know, offering support to the community because people were coming to me with questions and then it turned into rescue work. And then we officially formed as a nonprofit rescue. Um, We started in 2016, but we've been rescuing animals for at least a decade. That's craziness. Like I I honestly couldn't imagine doing it for that long. So kind of like how you said that at some point we all become somebody's like reptile person like and you know with obviously it's not a small population all things considered but it's a pretty small reptile community up in Anchorage and surrounding areas so not a whole lot of reptile people up there so you kind of just did you just get flooded with everybody's questions all the time yeah we've gotten to the point too where there's not a whole lot like you said, it's not a massive community, but there is definitely a community up here and there's definitely reptile owners here. And being one of the only places that provides certain services mm-hmm. here in Alaska means that we do get a lot of, we do get flooded with rescues. Um, they come in waves, also questions, boarding, because there's nowhere else in the state that offers reptile boarding right now. Right. So if someone needs to go out of state, you know, out of town, travel, anything like that, and we're kind of it for official boarding. So we try and make it affordable for folks so that their critters are taken care of while they're gone and they don't have to worry about it being this big financial strain and opt to leave them with somebody who may not be qualified or understand the needs and care of them as much. So Yeah, it makes sense. There's a lot of a, a lot of misconceptions of reptiles outside of the hobby where they're they're not puppies they're not cats they're not even really birds although there's some argument about that um but we know a lot about them not as much about reptiles and things like that so it's it is kind of hard to find somebody to take care of things when you can't anymore um which is actually what i was really hoping to really kind of get in a little bit uh with you because like I, like i said not everything can make it into a 15 minute video uh when when i was up there um you know it's because it is an isolated community to quite some degree um you do offer kind of a lot of the services that i would assume that a lot of places otherwise have like 
multiple of different reptile stores and Facebook groups and things like that, where you just kind of had to become a jack of all trades for everything. Correct. Basically anything reptile. Um, yeah. In addition to the boarding, we also do shipping because in order to drive out of state, if you're moving to anywhere in the U S you have to drive through Canada. So crossing that Canadian border going in and out of America can be sometimes kind of tricky. And with the temperature difference between Alaska and most of the rest of the U.S. too, when you're shipping, it can be kind of problematic and tricky. And if you move out of state too, in the middle of winter, that's not really feasible either because it's too cold to ship. So we do a lot of watching animals in the winter time and then shipping them. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of challenges that you would not expect from having from being so isolated, things you wouldn't think of until you're in an isolated area. Right. And I mean, we've got some of the outlying communities too that have reached out for assistance, but they're, you know, a plane ride and a ferry ride away and they don't have you know, even a FedEx and there's only so much you can really do. We've had some snakes come in from the Aleutian Islands. Oh my gosh. We've had the, we've had folks that are in Fairbanks that are traveling and don't know where to leave their critters. So they, drive down to where we're located just north of Anchorage. It's about a six hour drive. And then they fly out of Anchorage, but they leave their critters with us and then pick them up and drive them back home with them on their way back. So crazy. Yeah. And then finding the vet too sometimes can be a drive. Oh yeah, that's nuts. I know it's <sighs> yeah, there's there's a lot that I think we get I think I guess we could say take uh I mean <laughs> there it is um we take for granted just because it's not something that like you said we don't ever have to deal with and we don't ever think about um like is there because i know it's probably the first thing that i thought of too when i first heard about you guys when uh our mutual acquaintance uh told us about you know the community up there um do you ever have any issues with heating or with power or do a lot of people i should say because you guys are pretty well established um, do a lot of people have issues with heating and uh, with lighting and obviously with humidity because that's a big part of it? Yeah, it's very dry up here and there's a lot you have to keep in mind and a lot of backup plans. There have been a lot of local conversations. You know, people make posts in local groups and we'll post, you know, stuff about, hey, let's all take a moment and think about our emergency preparedness mm -hmm. because when things happen like a storm hits, um, it does get pretty windy here in the valley where we're located. And all it takes is one power line and then you don't have heat and it's the middle of winter time. So having those extra backups, those, do you have a generator? You know, that's huge. Do you have somewhere you can go that's far enough away that's in a different power grid that if you lose power, you can go take your critters to their place. You know, that kind of thing is extremely important. And it's important to have those emergency heat packs on hand, et cetera, et cetera. And I think another thing too that people don't think about is, you know, if something happens and we can't get somewhere or go someplace, we had the uh, big earthquake of 2018, I think it was, the 7-2. I think so. That sounds accurate. Yeah. It was a 7-2 quake and we lost power and we didn't have any heat. It was November oh, and everyone lost power, but also, you know, the roads were blocked. People were trying to get gas. People were freaking out. You know, the whole roads were torn apart. And it was scary. It was extremely scary. And on top of that, a lot of people had damaged enclosures and now they didn't have anywhere to put their animals, you know, and aquatics, fish, red air slider turtles. Those were huge because tanks just burst. Oh, man. Um, you know, and we experienced some damage, but nothing, most of our damage had nothing to do with the reptiles, which was, which was very fortunate. We had one enclosure that broke, but it was actually in our vehicle at the time. Oh, geez, that's crazy like that's that's nuts yeah we had um, fall over and we had an exoterra fall over with a crested gecko in it and the the doors popped open but the glass didn't break oh geez the animal stayed inside well at least i mean the crested gecko was okay but yeah. that's that's still crazy that that's like you you are correct that i think a lot of people do need to think you know about contingency plans and things like that but that's definitely something that has to be a bit more in like the forefront of your uh you know the thought process of getting into anything i think being alaskan too kind of already that's kind of built into our mentality 
Yeah. They're very kind of ready. You know, it's typical to be like, I've got my road flare, my jumper cables. And, you know, they, they have a tendency of having, you know, their food storage and their guns and, <laughs> you know, what whatever they need to be able to take care of themselves. Well, I mean, that's kind of, that's part of it, right? I mean, that's, I, I think when I was up there, I saw my, the most adorable uh, shirt that I ever saw and I might get some hate, but it was, um, it was Alaska, the biggest state. And then in, it was just the silhouette of the state and then it had a state and then it had the silhouette of Texas and it said, and this is its little sister. And it's yeah. like, that's, you guys do kind of have to have that, you know, nitty gritty, almost boy scout mentality of just whatever comes, we got this. Yeah. Well, and the relative population and how long it takes stuff to get shipped up here, you know, in case of emergency supplies, we're not, we're not the first stop. No, not at all. And then you guys do have a FedEx hub there in Anchorage, right? Yeah, we've got one here in Wasilla too, just north of Anchorage. Okay. The shipping is always more expensive and it always takes longer. Yeah, I know that's why I, after talking to a couple other people up there, um, it seems like other than some of the larger and more well-known like businesses and people, they don't ship up there really at all for both supplies or live animals. No, they really don't. Which is another reason why everything's just so isolated and things. Yeah. Um, but hey, I do know that you guys have some fun, some some fun stuff up there. Yes, there's there's always stuff to do, even yep. in the dead of winter. There's there's always stuff to do. So. Right. Definitely exciting. <laughs> it's true. So I know that's one of the like that's. Would you say that's probably the biggest issue? Issue or hardship, I guess you could say, is just kind of the supply chain? I would say that's one of the bigger ones. Um, that and um, the supply chain as well as just the cost of living. It's yeah. Expensive living up here. Um, but also it's almost to an extent, I mean, you know, we live in a city, but there's mm -hmm. still days when it's like you're carving your way out of the landscape. You know, there's there's things you got to watch out for. Moose, hitting moose with your car. Yep. You know, windstorms, rain. Rainstorms are actually worse than rain, windstorms because if it rains in the wintertime, it gets warm enough during the day. And oh, yeah. The temperatures drop at night, and in the morning, the roads are just black ice. Jeez. So it makes travel hard. It makes transportation hard, and that's why it's always good to have, you know, food on hand so you don't have to go out anywhere. Don't leave your gas tank on empty. Kind of stuff, so. Right. So with all, all in mind that people have to think about with getting really any sort of pet animal, but specifically with an exotic that not everybody have needs, you had said earlier that you've essentially kind of created a niche for yourself of, you know, providing some services. So of all the different services that like a reptile keeper would need, i.e., as you said, boarding and tips and advice and things like that do you um i was probably is that that probably your biggest one is the boarding um our biggest one actually is probably rescue and adoption okay but we also do education is huge and plays a huge role in what we do right both the general public as well as to reptile owners okay we do our best if there's a way that we can keep an animal with their family Mm -hmm. it's something that they can just change with their husbandry that could correct an issue where they can keep their animal because they have the desire to learn then that's fantastic that's so awesome and we support that 100 percent. but we're here if it gets to be too much and you, you find yourself maybe the animal's regressing or it's not something that's within your budget or your lifestyle or something to be able to do to correct mm -hmm. the issue in order to keep that animal healthy then then what we do there plays a huge role and so a lot of it we found is education because the more we educate, the less rescues we get. Because if you can start someone off correctly, yep. and someone wants to get a critter and they come to you with all their questions and you can help them get it set up with their proper setup with the thermostat and everything that they need to do it correctly right out the gate and to get the right animal for them, then that animal is going to fare so much better, especially when they know they can come to us with any questions that they have so if they have a question instead of just guessing and having it be to the animal's detriment that would potentially 
turn into a reason why it would need to become a rescue, then the animal's better off, the owners are better off, and ultimately as a rescue, we have less intake. So we put a lot of emphasis on that. And so that is one of the services that we provide to the community. And thankfully, there are other sources in the community that also provide that education too, which is absolutely fantastic because there's so much education that can be done that sharing the load is absolutely wonderful. Um, and then adoption as well, because we do have animals that get rehabilitated and then they do need a new home, you know? And so finding that right home that is ready for that critter, that's done the research, that has the setup, and then they get to take that animal in, then they can come to us with questions. We already know that animal too. Right. So that's huge because the adoption relationship doesn't end when the animal walks out the door. The adoption relationship is for as long as you have the animal, for as long as yep. the animal is alive even if that means bringing the animal back should your lifestyle change. Um, but another, you know, there are other services too that we have other local businesses that that meet those needs, such as, you know, supplying rodents and mm -hmm. bugs and, you know, local breeders, because there are some local breeders that can provide quality animals if someone's looking for, you know, a specialized morph or breed of something. And so there's there's a lot out there and there are some businesses that and that we rely on heavily, and a lot of it is is recommendations. You know, here I'm going to send you over here, and I'm going to send you over here, and together between those sources, we can make sure that somebody who's starting off with their animal or already has one can take care of them properly because a lot of the local sources are where it's at. You know, and if we lose one or two of those local sources, then a lot of reptile keepers will be able to figure that out. Oh, geez. Um, I'm actually kind of glad that you brought up the, the feeders and insects and things like that. Cause I know that became pr a pretty big issue a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. There was, a uh, an issue with like breeding rats and mice. Yeah, it is. It is illegal to breed certain rats, like albino rats um, in port cities. So hmm. there is regulations and restrictions regarding that and so between that and the shipping costs for getting rodents up here by ordering through um, frozen feeder supplies in the lower 48 as we call the rest of the u.s yep um it makes it extremely difficult to be able to find sources to feed your snakes we do have a locally owned pet store and they um, started restricting their rat sales for live rats and so that made it even more difficult because where would somebody who has a snake that's currently refusing anything other than live get their food? Right. So to have local breeders meet the supply and the demand of local reptile owners is huge. And without that, I don't even know where we'd be. And whether that's rodents, whether that's bugs, you know, we've got the bug dealers, we've got Alaska feeder farm and other small breeders as well. And they're huge in making sure that our animals stay fed and we rely on them as well as a rescue. Yeah. So is that, are there a lot of shortages when it comes to feeders, especially for people who have larger collections? Um, Cause I know like even the, the big, like the big, the big three uh, frozen suppliers, they frequently have shortages. So is with the essentially kind of people's hands being tied a little bit for breeding locally, are there ever, kind of shortages seasonally or anything like that? There can be, thankfully. Um, what we found being one of the the larger places, you know, one of the larger mm -hmm. reptile facilities that needs, that needs rodents and bugs is that with our feeders, we found that if we approach someone and we say, hey, this is what we've got, can you meet it? And we let them know this is the demand, mm -hmm. they can then increase the supply to meet that. That's so I cool. think that locally they've been really great at increasing supply to meet demand where needed. Um, of course, as with anything, there are shortages. Um, even with the recent dubia shortage, you know, they, they saw it come in, they planned ahead, they started um, cultivating colonies of alternate feeding sources so that when that happened, it was like, well, here's an alternative feeding source. You know, we've got red runners, we've got other things that you could feed your critters and it adds more variety to their diet too. And so being able to anticipate those kind of shortages, and I know some things you can't, you can't anticipate, but we've been very fortunate in 
being able to still have local supply. Okay. Yeah, I know that's it's like a an entire secondary business for like places down here. There's it used to be it was all like all either frozen stuff, you bred your own, or there were like two guys, and now just around the Denver area, there's like seven um that are all fairly legitimate. Um and so you guys don't breed um rodents up there. You just do um dubia colonies, I think, right? We've got dubia and hisser colonies right now. We've done our own super worms and mealworms. Um, but generally speaking, we don't breed our own feeders due to space constraints, time yeah. constraints, and just the number that we'd have to feed. We should let let the ones that want to do it do it, and we'll support local. That's fine. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Ends up being a, a bigger project and more of yeah. a time constraint than the actual reptiles themselves. So that's not one service that you do um, that you do offer, but. I do really like that you guys continue to embrace the, like just the continual education and answering questions of both the novice keeper, the, just the general education and everything like that. Because I know that after you've been keeping reptiles for a while, you can get kind of jaded to the, like the new guy questions. Um, and that scares people off. And that is, ends up being detrimental for the animal because it's not like it's really going to prevent that person from going out and getting the animal but maybe you could have helped along the way if you would have just, you know, answered the same question for the 500th time. And it, and it can be very intimidating. And, you know, that's why we've had people come over for two plus hours and just ask a million questions before they get their first ball python. Right. And that's fantastic because the only stupid question is the one you're not asking because if it's going to benefit the animal and if it's going to benefit you and that animal is going to be better in the long run, Totally, totally for it. Keep them coming. You know, and sometimes it can feel like, oh, you know, more questions, that kind of stuff. But if you just kind of adapt that attitude that this is this is furthering our mission, even if they don't adopt the animal from us, even if they don't get supplies from us, even if they never utilize any of our services and there's never actually any income towards the rescue, mm -hmm. we're furthering our mission. So that's a win. Yep. Exactly. That's I do love that so much. It's I it's it's difficult to do that when you do a rescue at all in general, but I'm really glad that there are I mean essentially you guys have kind of grandfathered into that role as just kind of like the the fairy godparents of the reptile community up there in AK. Yep. And and that's awesome. And I love it. I love that people, you know, have a source where they can go for their information. They can go for, you know, even if it's just, hey, which which bulb do you reckon, recommend us getting on Amazon? Like, fantastic, cool. And we'll send you a link. Like, here's a recommended Facebook group that's super fantastic for bioactive setups. Nice. Anything like that. Just being able to point resources because, unfortunately, there's so much conflicting information out there mm -hmm. that people get stressed out when they first dip, dip their toe in the water. And, unfortunately, with a lot of the way that like you said, the experienced versus the newbie reptile keepers, sometimes the way that people speak to each other online or in person can be really daunting. And, yeah. you know, someone doesn't, is afraid to ask a question because they don't want to get filleted alive. And that's intimidating and not really acceptable, you know. And even in our local group, we've had, you know, local groups where people maybe – share a picture of an enclosure that is way off or something like that. But I've always been really impressed with um, our community's ability to express it in a way that's helpful and kind and respectful because people, even if they're going about it the wrong way, if you present something to them in a respectful way, they're going to be way more open to it and that's going to benefit the animal. And I, I do like that. And it's, you know, I know everyone hates on the different like online Facebook groups and things like that, but I mean, that's really the best way to perpetuate knowledge in general. And yeah, there's a lot of misinformation period, but I do see that in either the more isolated or honestly, it seems like a lot of the more like novice or kind of younger intro into there where it's just like you said, where, excuse me, where it's, you know, sharing a picture of something or an animal that may not necessarily be the best pet for a lot of people. It is more of the open, honest 
you know, criticism, critique, advice versus you're killing your iguana. Stop right. it. Stop it. Yeah, it's and it, it, it's nice to see that every once in a while. And it seems like that's, yeah, there's always going to be issues because people are people. But it just seems like it's a little bit more, would you say close knit up there? I would say close knit. I think Just, that another part of it too is is when you're when you're sharing that information and when you're trying to educate to be able to also maybe open the lines of communication directly. You know, mm -hmm. don't hesitate to message. Here's a phone number. Call. Let's discuss. Right. You know, and give people maybe that option to maybe ask their questions privately in a way that they're not going to get, you know, verbally attacked because they're doing things incorrectly then they can get that open line of communication and feel like they can ask questions without being judged. Yep. And I, I wish that more people were, you know, able to do that with a little bit more humility, but <laughs> that is what it is, I guess. Um, but another do thing you do? Oh, sorry. Oh, what was that? Sorry. I, I was I, gonna I... Talk about how the, the reptile community and husbandry and our understanding of it is always evolving and it's always changing. Yep. There's all these new things, too, even on the veterinary side of things. We're always learning new things. So another thing to keep in mind is to just be super open-minded about things because what might have been how things were absolutely had to be done 10 years ago does not mean that that's how it should be done now because of the things that we're learning. And exactly. so another thing, too, with keeping reptiles is that we need to be open-minded to these changes and these new things in terms of husbandry and how we keep them because you know it used to be that pulling a snake out of their enclosure and feeding them in a separate feeding tub was like how you had to do it or you're gonna get bitten you know mm -hmm. and then just how it's changed so drastically and that's just one example that it's important too that if someone says something you know maybe they're stuck in that and they haven't gotten the latest updates and you know it's important to always stay open-minded with that as well it is i mean it's there's still heat rocks, so, yep. you know. That one at the thrift store today. Oh, really? Ugh. I mean, they still sell them brand new, so I don't I don't understand. I guess it's that if it tried it once, let's just keep it rolling mentality that yeah. takes a long time to, you know, has to be really tried and true, I guess. Yeah. But um, I was going to say, I know that, you know, you do a lot of, um, as you mentioned before, kind of networking a little bit between different people in the community that can do different things. Do you, because as you know, we've mentioned several times at this point, um, the supply issue, do you guys ever keep on hand um, some of the more like specialty supplies that uh, even like the, you know, the big box stores and chains have a hard time getting their hands on for people? Um, not really as far as specialty supplies, but we do, we do try and make things cheaper and easier for folks mm -hmm. with the things done correctly. We do have an exchange program um, for enclosures. So we keep it super cheap, cheaper than pet store rates because we don't want someone to be intimidated and then go out and get the kit because the kit is going to be the best thing for the animal because it has a picture of the animal in the box. Right. So we also have an exchange program where if you have an enclosure, say you start off with a small lizard, and you put it, you know, small gecko and you put it in a smaller enclosure. And then as it grows, we want to encourage you to upgrade. Mm -hmm. so instead of having to buy a brand new expensive enclosure from the pet store, you can bring your previous one, whether you purchased it from us or not, in and exchange it for that price for that enclosure off your new one. Cool. So at the end of the day, whether you buy four enclosures as you upgrade throughout your reptile's life or you just buy the final one at the end, your price is going to be the same. As right. long as we have them available and our availability does fluctuate, you know, as our need for what the supplies we have or, you know, whether we just sold them, whatnot, like mm -hmm. it's hard to see what we have at any given time, but we do have wait lists for things, you know, if someone's looking for a certain size or a certain, certain item, we can certainly wait list them for that. And that's really cool. That's that I, that is really, really cool. Cause I know that's, Another thing that people like to fight about is you know, like the enclosure size and kind and, and yada yada. So the fact that there is a really good alternate option and a nice easy option that, you know, encourages good husbandry. That's really great. It seems like 
I, I knew we talked a lot when we were over there, but it seems like every time I talk to you, I just learn even more and it's really great. I really like it. Yeah, and we we know which companies that build really nice enclosures that ship to Alaska. Mm -hmm. And so when someone's looking and they're stressed out because they add something to the cart and they finally figure out what they want and then they go and they go to check out and they enter their zip code and it says, you know, that they only ship to the continental US, that can be really stressful because you're like, well, that's the one I wanted. And now you have to start the whole process over with maybe this business or contact these folks. And then shipping ends up being like $900. Oh. I figured out which businesses are, you know, work really well with being willing to ship to Alaska and do it reasonably. And so we can make recommendations based on that that's specific to our local community versus making a post in some nationwide reptile group on what they recommend because shipping right. does play such a huge part in it. And we have had local enclosure builders too. Um, our last main enclosure builder just moved out of state, unfortunately. Um, so we're kind of in the market one for our local community here for the DIY racks and the enclosures. So right. hopefully someone's willing to take that mantle soon. That'd be nice. I, I'm aware that it's probably not the most financially like smart idea at first, but I always wondered like with what could essentially be cornering the market a little bit, like it'd be really cool. Like if a player, if a, you know, a group like you or somebody, one of the other big, big players like partnered with one of the companies that could build up there, you know, it's, you know, Hey, you can, you know, for a nice like discount rate where you like shipping in bulk with their logo and then it just has like your little sticker stamp at the bottom of it so that way it's just this nice like consistent steady stream and i feel like a company could you know turn a decent profit by you know partnering up with you guys and being essentially the exclusive to you guys up there and i just thought it was really cool absolutely and the the gentleman that had that we had up here that was building the enclosures you know we we had even discussed you know we've got someone come in they're adopting this animal, go to him, he'll build an enclosure that's specific for this animal, and then it being kind of like a joint venture kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't even need it. There was so much demand for his enclosures and what he was doing that he ended up just having to say, I don't have the time Yeah. For to, to add another one to my list because there's, and he was cranking them out fast, but there's just, Jeez. you know, when you can't just order them or go to your local reptile store and get really nice reptile enclosures you know there's there's not a lot and we have a lot of people that approach us and say i need something big for my iguana you know will you build us a tortoise table because you know but unfortunately with our time we we, we don't have the time to take that on so yeah it is that is a whole other venture too and i totally get that i mean i just found a bunch of really large tubs because i'm the world's worst ball python breeder um, so I get, you know, 70 quart tubs instead of the 41 quarts that everybody has. And so there's just a stack of 12 tubs sitting in my living room right now, taking up space that the puppies crashed into six times already that's that funny. just don't ever have time to get to right away. So, but that's still really, uh, that's really cool though. Yep. You know, which apologies, you probably might hear the dogs going back and forth. There's the puppy who's crying and then we're watching another dog who is, they're out of town, so we're watching that dog, and that dog is a ball of uh, cocaine wrapped in uh, Ritalin, so um, yeah. Well, we've got an Aussie healer, so we know the we know the cocaine. She's probably an Aussie mix. She's like uh, like a jet black, like probably like Lab Shepherd Aussie mix, and so she's just oh, yeah. she's nuts. Um, but yeah. hooray! Definitely. <laughs> is that my toy? She's got her big ears that are the size of her face staring at me. Yep, of course. Um, so, you know, in addition to the education, like you said, it's the rescue and the boarding that are kind of like your next big one. Um, and touched a little bit on it in the video. Again, um, comes out soon, but it'll be a little bit before. That'll come out before this podcast is released, but just because I, I try to keep it on a, on a consistent schedule. Um, but trying to figure out the best way, how I want to go and have this proceed. So we'll start with boarding. We'll go with boarding first. Um, you get kind of, you get a lot of boarding, both short-term and long-term, correct? We get a decent amount of boarders. Yeah. 
Uh, it and does fluctuate. We've had as many as 29 <laughs> and as few as zero. It just really depends on on the time. <laughs> oh, geez. And so a lot of it, is it a lot for traveling, for school, for like seasonal work? Like I know a lot of people do summers in up there and then go down to the lower for winters and is a lot of that kind of we've done we've done deployments we've done a lot of military moves and right generally yep. speaking that includes when when folks are moving there's usually a higher number it's like i'm moving and i have seven or mm -hmm. you know something like that where there's there's a handful of them that they're taking with them and so they would board and then get shipped um for things like vacation I don't think vacation's ever been more than four. Um, so those usually aren't that much. Little weekend trips. Can you watch my bearded dragon kind of thing? But it's usually the movings that are the larger numbers that come through. And we do a lot of moving boarding. Cool. And I know you um, I know you mentioned that eventually shipping. And so that's kind of a thing that you help people with is, you know, again, as you said, with specifically the, like the military moving and stuff, you'll, help board the their reptiles and then kind of help them with the shipping process yep yep so a lot of it would be either if you're moving to alaska you ship your animals to us we'll board them until you're here and then you can pick up your critters or you drop your animals off you move out of state once you're there and you're established and their enclosures are ready we ship them to you weather permitting sometimes we do have to hang on to them longer um, to take advantage of you know weather windows mm -hmm. um, we had We've had one actually where someone was moving to Juneau and she was moving with her snake, but she was flying. And so she had to ship the snake, then fly to Juneau, and then we would ship it to her in Juneau. So it was kind of like a... Oh, geez. We never actually met her, but her snake is fantastic. <laughs> that's so, that's just so crazy. Like, that's just not something that we'd even think that would have to be a necessity, but that's really great that you do that <laughs> yeah i think another one is just just people going out of town um we have had some emergent boarding cases mm -hmm. apartments flooding uh, fumigating homes things like abusive situations yeah those where it was like a i have to leave and i have to get out of the situation my animals need to come with me because they can't stay in the situation we've actually had quite a number of those um, which can be kind of scary, but then, you know, it's like boarding for an unknown period of time where it's like, you, you take care of you. And when you're ready, they'll be here You know, when That's... You're ready and established and not, you know, when you have a home and you're safe, then we can, we can help you get out. So domestic violence situation. Well, it's unfortunate that you had to preface that with quite a few. Ooh. More than I'd like. Yeah. But it's always really rewarding when when we can reconnect those animals with their parents because it's like this is your mom this is your dad you know like right that situation and now they can have their animal back and that's huge because then when they're worried about their safety they don't have to be worried about their animals that is really good that that's you know that is one thing that they don't have to worry about where yeah like you said they can just take care of themselves get safe get out of harm's way out of all of that which yeah <sighs> unfortunately um but um with that said do you do you end up getting kind of a lot of long-term borders that eventually become kind of rescue and adoptions yeah we have had some um borders that turned into surrenders mm -hmm. um with that as part of our boarding paperwork and our boarding process we do need something in writing before we ever adopt out or consider anything like that in terms of accepting full ownership of the animal. So we have to make X number of attempts to contact you and document those, those attempts um, before we would take it into our own hands to take, make sure that the animal is cared for, whether that's here or whether that's finding a permanent adopted home. Um, but there, there are situations where we have had to, the owner has been in a situation where they've had to relinquish the rights to the animal um, of their own voluntary Volition. voluntarily relinquish <laughs> that's sort of voluntarily relinquish ownership of the animal okay um in which case we would keep them in 
till you know if there's any health concerns we would make sure that those are addressed and when they're healthy and we're ready and we find the right home whether it's right away whether it's months whether it's years and then they can get adopted from there right. um the hard one is when someone surrenders an animal or sorry boards an animal that's not being cared for properly at all like right. to the point they need serious medical attention or they're just not in a good situation but legally you can't keep that animal and at the end of the boarding term those are really hard because you're releasing the animal to something that you know was not to the animal's benefit and it's actually to their detriment health wise but legally that animal is not surrendered and so you can talk to the owner but there's not much you can do at the end of the day except oh, make sure yeah. they're cared for while they're here but it doesn't matter how much medical attention they get here if they go back to the situation that was what they came from it's not going to do much so yeah i was going to ask a get into that unfortunately mentally hard boarding cases but yeah for privacy and confidentiality that's about as far into that as i'm gonna go (laughs) no then that's the absolutely most you know the correct and appropriate thing to do um which kind of gets into the next part is you know rescuing reptiles that's a really big commitment for a lot of reasons and that's the hardest one other than you know the financial aspect of because most of the time when you rescue a reptile they're usually fairly far gone um in a lot of bad cases but yeah that's that heartbreaking part that i personally can't do yeah and that's probably the hardest part it's not probably that is the hardest part right um, we just had to put it down a dragon this weekend who's been here for two years. Mm. And I cried like a little girl, you know. And if you think about the number of bearded dragons that have come through here, you know, just just that the large amount of bearded dragons that can come through here, but you know, it just takes one and, and it's you know, from an outsider's perspective, you can say, You've had so many bearded dragons that you've rehabilitated or that have come through that have passed, you know, why are you still crying? But it's it hits you every time yeah it well, it does it's it, i mean i've we it's hard when they're here for for 30 minutes when they're here for six hours and they don't make it because helping an animal across the rainbow bridge is never something anybody wants to do especially when they wait so long that by the time they get to you it's it's they're just looking for a miracle at that point you know right. when when folks wait too long to reach out to get help with their animal, then, you know, there's a certain threshold where after a certain point, you're like, we will literally do everything we can, but, but, you know, there's only so much that we can do. There's only so far we can pull an animal back. Yeah. You're laying out the reason why I'm not a vet. That's the, that's the exact reason why, but yeah, cause it's, you know, not only is it that people, I don't like to say that, but they like to wait, you know, unfortunately, either because they don't want to deal with the hassle or finding a good vet or, you know, sometimes that reptiles, they just don't show that there's something going on unless, and even, yeah. even if you know what you're looking for, you know, yeah. sometimes you can't. Well, and we've had, we've had cases come in where they they've asked us to take in an animal and when we ask if there's health concerns the answer is no but then when we see the animal we're like hey we need to go to the vet and they just didn't know because they didn't know enough about the animal to know what healthy looks like or the signs and what to look for to know what is or isn't a health concern you know and that goes back to boarding as well if you have joe blow who's great with dogs watching your lizard that's fantastic but if joe blow doesn't know that this is a sign of something that's off. Yep. And how are we going to know when the animal's in their care, even for a short period of time, whether something's right or something's wrong, whether or not to take the animal to the vet, whether or not to. It's true. And that's, that can be hard too. I mean, and I mean, and again, even people who do some research, like if you have a bearded dragon, that's always moving the cage or you have a ball python that's mo- always moving in their cage. That's can mean two entirely different things that are, one's good one's bad and you don't know and if one's always moving and the opposite if one's always staying still and not moving and the other one's you know never coming out again that's and it's hard for people to figure that out even if they do try to do their due diligence correct i mean and we've had we've had folks even that are like 
my snake's moving its head a little weird. It's IBD, you know, and they just, they don't, you know, they look at the internet and the internet says it's this because, you know, once you Google that you have a paper cut, then you have cancer, you know, so we've had it too where it's like, your animal is actually fine, you know? Yeah. If you're concerned, you can seek veterinary assistance, but from what we're looking at, this looks to be normal behavior, you know? So there's that too, and it's just unfamiliarity because mm-hmm. if you aren't familiar with something, there's not really a way for you to know until you have that experience what is and isn't okay behaviors or signs and symptoms. Right. So, so I know that, you know, you you do quite a few, well, at this point, I don't know how many shows you're doing right now, um, but you did quite a few educational shows kind of ranging in like from, you know, grade schooler tykes up to like what's kind of the most intricate show that you've ever done? Oh, that was a hard one. We've done some shows for large groups of people, like four or 500 folks. Oh, wow. We've also done personalized one-on-one therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, it doesn't matter how many people are going to be there. If you have space, we can do it. Okay. Let us know in advance, but right. Well, ultimately we've done something for everybody. We've done. Cool. uh, We've actually done sessions like courses where it's a 10 week course and you enroll and then every week, you know, for an hour, you learn about a different reptile and we've incorporated crafts and presentations and you can really dive into, dive deeper into it. Um, We've done birthday parties, educational events at classrooms, libraries, uh, senior homes, disability centers, a whole, whole variety, whole gamut. Right. You know, scouts. I feel like there's probably not a whole lot we haven't done at this point you know we've yeah. kind of incorporated in the local parades and local events for yeah just a whole lot of stuff the expo that we had here definitely super involved with that so it just you know we do about one to two events a week Private even now school. yep even now cool that's really cool um that's actually what i was i was going to ask a little bit about because you know it's uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, how it's, you know, hard to tell unless you know a whole lot, but do you, do you do kind of a lot of those in-depth ones for people who are truly interested in this, like in the, in your, what seems to be very rapidly growing community? It's very awesome. rapidly growing. For the in-depth stuff, honestly, that usually turns into volunteer work. Okay. So someone's like super interested, they want to get involved. Well, I a volunteer application, you know, spend some time over here and that hands-on is the best way to learn. So for the folks that are looking for, you know, I've got somebody who's, you know, meets the age requirements that just really, you know, does all the research and just really wants to be more involved, then that's usually a good way for them to become involved. And then through that, they can either be part of our care and maintenance team, which cares for and feeds and cleans the animals, Mm -hmm. or they can be part of the educational team that goes out and does the ambassador work at schools and libraries and homes and events but they also um, I mean we've got volunteers to do both cool. which is fantastic you know they care for the animals they get to know them they bring them out in the public and it's wonderful and they learn and they get really in-depth and involved so we don't do too many courses and classes that we've done before um, but especially now that everything's virtual in terms of classrooms mm-hmm. um, we we're doing more field trips versus actually going into classrooms. Interesting. So class are like small classes actually coming over to your facility? Yep. That's cool. Yeah, homeschool tours. Um, there are also homeschool curriculum programs. So like local homeschool, um, local homeschools that will actually, you know, call and book X number of field trip slots mm-hmm. and then they family sign up for it. And then they just go and coordinate it through the school and then they just come out on their scheduled time for their, their field trip. That's really cool. That is fun. So like a little mini trip to the reptile zoo. That's really awesome. And then we do our best to cater it to the group. So, mm-hmm. you know, the group might get to, you know, super interested in learning about frogs, more amphibians or the, you know, insect arachnid side of things. Maybe one of them's more, I, you know, we had a group where all they wanted to do was turtles and tortoises. They just okay. had a shell, and if it didn't, you know, I, you know, no matter how many times we brought up lizards or snakes or anything else, they were like, no, we just, this, it's, it's their hour. You know, if that's what you want to learn about. So we got really in depth with tortoises, like let's 
let's dive into this, you know, and some of them are just kind of, we want to see a little bit about everything. So it's odd, but we get to touch on a lot of different subjects. So that's really cool. No two groups and no two events are the same. That's awesome. I, I really like that. And I'd really like to be able to get into doing that a little bit more, but I have a lot of competition down here, unfortunately. Yeah. And that, that's one thing we don't have up here Uh which is good and bad um we are booked through july already so you know it can you know it can be a bummer deal when someone wants to book for something next week and you're having a birthday party and you're like well we can fit you in right (laughs) you know but there's only so many days in a week so it's true we can only do so much but we also have to make sure that we're allotting time for caring for the animals and making sure that their needs are met prior to scheduling any events because um, while education and doing those events is extremely important and it is um, a financial benefit as well for the rescue, making sure that the animals are cared for is always going to be our number one priority. Absolutely. So that's always going to be what happens first and everything else happens. Mm -hmm. So that's um, those volunteers are really important. Do you guys have quite a few of them? I think I remember seeing like a, like a schedule or something posted up. Yeah, we've got a pretty good team. Um, they're fantastic. We always have a lot of fun. Like every time they come over, it's it's like the events. It's always different. You know, we've got mm-hmm. volunteers that come over and we're all just working and we're having a good time. We're talking reptiles and, you know, something, something crazy always happens. You know, we had just the other day, we put the tortoises outside to get some sun while we were cleaning Right. And we hear the sound and it's pouring rain. Oh and no. Like, oh no. You know, and unlike probably where you're from, the rain up here is not really warm. And so while it could be sunny and warm, the moment it starts raining, like so we were all out there with towels like in the rain, scooping up tortoises and bring oh, you know, so it's just it's always something. And so there's always something to laugh about at the end of the day, like right. wasn't it crazy how she was you know, you have to feed her that rat, she totally missed and all this got you know, or yeah, there's there's always something. That is so, really cool. A lot of fun, but we do have an, a good number of volunteers and a really, really good support system, both with our board members and our volunteers. So um, it's definitely not a one person operation. It absolutely would not physically be able to be. So we would have, we would have tapped out a long time ago had that been the case. I'm really glad that you, you know, you brought up the board thing. Cause that's definitely what, I mean, it's a bit of a gatekeeping thing, but it seems like that's definitely what really separates the true legitimate, you know, not necessarily business, but doing things the right way, moving forward, the the best way for both the people involved and the animals versus someone who, you know, I like snakes. So if you guys can't keep them, I'll take them on a rescue. Wink, wink. Right. <laughs> I would like an animal, but I don't want to pay for it. But, and I definitely believe that there are independent rescuers out there that do so much good. And we've seen them do so much good. Um, but you are right. There are folks out there too that are just looking for an animal and they just don't really feel like paying for it. And they'd rather take on, you know, someone else's for spine from a box store. Again, nothing wrong with that. Um, but definitely having a board and, you know, being that 501c3, um, it helps with grants. It helps with fundraising. It also helps with, you know, having that support system where it's like, you know, here's a situation how are we going to proceed with the situation mm-hmm. put it to a vote, you know? And we've, we've had some situations that have been really like pro con, do we, don't we, you know, and being able to make those decisions and have other folks there to bounce ideas off of and to say, is this going to be to the betterment of the rescue? Is this going to be the best for the animals? Right. And our board was selected by our board was selected for people that are, always going to prioritize the animals that was the number one stipulation when we were looking for board members is their priority always going to be the animals or is it going to be making a buck is it going to be you know being popular or anything like that and if that priority is not number one the animals then this is not a good fit for them and that's for our volunteers so knowing that at the end of the day However, we decide to do, because it's not one person making a decision, it's a group of people making a decision mm-hmm. on behalf of the animals, we can trust that those decisions are going to be well thought out and they're going to prioritize what needs to be prioritized. That's really great. I love hearing stuff like that because it is it is unfortunately like the big catch-22 of this entire hobby and to a degree industry where it's, you know, at one point, 
are you you know the you know the skin trader this the, the the animal peddler versus someone who just likes to keep them and wants to be a part of their you know involvement in future for everybody and it's always this even you know from outside looking in and even in the inside where it's like the decisions that you make are they necessarily even if you're not directly you know harming or jeopardizing the animal's health integrity safety is it long term for the benefit of them correct versus correct. the other thing it's you know like the youtubes and everything like that it's is it going to harm the animal to show feeding videos and things like that or to you know prioritize making 19 tiktoks a day or would it be better suited to where you know maybe not so much and let's just maintain with you know keeping the animals like an extra five minutes of cleaning here and there versus yeah. making two tiktoks and things like that where it's it's hard to find a balance absolutely and one of the things that we take into consideration with every single rescue is the question if this animal doesn't get adopted ever uh -huh. meet its needs for the rest of its life and if the answer is no we won't take it in right and with some you know we've had larger iguanas that we've had to say no to because if we do not have the space or the means or the time to accommodate that iguana for the rest of its life then all we're doing is taking it from a not great situation and putting it in a not great situation and we're contributing to a problem and i've seen way too many cases where someone wants to help and their intentions are literal gold. But at the end of the day, what they're doing for the animal is not the best. Yeah. I so understand that's where that. We've received a lot of community support and in instances like using that one example, you know, if there's an adult iguana that we are not able to accommodate due to space reasons or time constraints, where can it go? We're mm -hmm. not just going to say no. We're going to reach out to people that we know that might have space or that might have room in their heart and their lives for something like that. And there have been many instances where maybe an animal doesn't come here, but we're still able to help facilitate it moving to a better place than where it currently is. That being said, there have been situations where it's like, this is life or death. And mm -hmm. in emergent situations like that, we pick up an animal, you know, right. if it's, you know, Hey, I just don't, can't find it at home right now, but it's healthy. Like, do we have space and the means to take that on for forever? And if the answer is yes, then absolutely. If the answer at that time, because of how many animals we have at any given time is mm -hmm. no, then who locally do we know that is looking for one? Let's see if we can get you paired with somebody who wants to open their home to a bearded dragon that's healthy. Right. So that way we can have an extra space open here for a bearded dragon that's not healthy. So. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And that's, I know that a lot of it is, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, the physical space of do we have the, you know, we have the ability to, but do we actually have the space yeah. <laughs> to do so? It's, you know, you know, like you said, you're happy to turn away large iguanids and things like that. Do you get, and I'm sure, you know, red eared sliders is always the, the big issue. That is big. And unfortunately, with the space that we have to work with, um, we are not able to accept aquatic turtles at this time, Yeah, which is really unfortunate because we get probably one to three of them that are attempted to be surrendered a week. Yeah. We get I'm... Maybe one to three a year that people are actually looking to adopt. Oh, you Jesus. know, the number of phone calls we're sending, we're looking for a ready or slider. I rarely get that. But when I do, I've got a phone number full or I've got a list full of phone numbers for people that have them and i'm like here's one if that doesn't work come back i'll give you another one <laughs> yep that's so. i don't know too many people that are willingly looking for rayered sliders no. Which... no even just this week someone posted in a local group that they had a couple looking for a home like, comments crickets no likes mm. nothing you know and it's unfortunate you know and it, it breaks my heart but if we take in one we have to take in a thousand and that's kind of where we are right now. Yep. And that's, if we don't have space for a thousand. Can't say yes to one. Yep. And that's, you know, the unfortunate part. Yeah. Are you guys at all thinking about expanding or buying a, you know, a separate property for specifically this? Cause I'm, I know you guys are at that point and probably have been for a while. Yeah. But. It seems like anytime we expand, 
we like expand and then we hit that ceiling so fast. Yep. So I know the demand is there. I know the need is there. Um, with everything going on in the world right now, that's not a step that we can feasibly take because yeah. of, you know the virus and how it's impacted housing community or the you know the market for housing right now and rentals is absurd. Yeah. So and we weren't thinking we didn't want to take that step when we weren't open for doing events because of you know COVID nineteen restrictions because that's where a lot of our funding comes from and if we can't rely on that funding then we're not going to expand. So we did have to put a pin in that project, but we are looking forward to being able to do that. And we are actively daily keeping our eyes open and looking for that facility that will meet our needs, that has what we need with the public facing, you know, so that we can have open hours instead of being by, you know, appointment only. And then ideally something that's residential as well, because with the amount of care that the animals need, it's not going to suit anybody to, to be far away and to have somebody on site, a caretaker on site at all times would be ideal. Right. And that's always like the scariest thing that I hear about, like people who have, you know, the million dollar collections and they're 15, 20 minutes away. So even when they put in all that money for like the alarm system to where like, oh, a temp spiked, not only in a in the room, but like in a cage, it's still half an hour before you get there. And that could be a life or death situation. Exactly. So having a caretaker on site is again, for the priority and benefit of the animals, it's not a, uh, that's not a condition we're willing to budge on. So right. being able to find that location might be kind of tricky. There's not a whole lot of residential commercial locations where we are, but it's definitely something we're always striving for because we want to be able to continue to offer these services to the community and to expand our ability to offer them. So. Yay. <laughs> Business and animals, it's complicated to say the least. Um, but with that, you know, kind of on the track of, you know, the limited space and things like that, I know that not all of the space can be allotted to just rescues or borders. You also have your own personal ambassadors and I guess pets to a lesser degree. Do you kind of have to keep a constant balance going of, your own animals, um, rescues and things that like you have a hard time with holding on to a lot. <laughs> um, it's bittersweet when an animal gets adopted, but right. the, the reptiles that I personally had before the rescue started, those ones act as our ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And, um, if ever it, there's a need for more ambassadors, we've had animals that have been part of our educational team for a year, two years, and then they get adopted out. You know, so just because an animal is part of our educational crew now does not mean that, you know, for the right family, they won't get adopted. And then, you know, we have another critter on our educational crew. Um, but it's important as well, that educational crew to show what healthy animals look like. Right. You know, and we've gone into vets and said, this is what it should look like. This is what it does look like. Here's how this animal got to this position. Here's how to make it look like this animal again you know right. so to have that comparison because when someone comes in and they say i want to adopt a bearded dragon how do i know if i'm feeding my bearded dragon enough well here's how to check you know the fat pads on their head you see this one this one's underweight see how his fat pads are sunken in you know now let's have a look at this one over here this is our educational dragon you see how his you know fat pads are you know an appropriate size blah 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 and then maybe sometimes even compare it to an obese one Yep. You know, here's a dragon that's being fed too much. And they're like, wow, I have that visual. I know what I'm looking for. And so having an educational, our educational team is not really just for, you know, birthday parties or anything like that. So no, it's just yeah. making sure that people know what it looks like versus not. Because if they're not familiar with that, how are they going to know? So Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so it's always really sad. And not sad, but like, you know, bittersweet when we've adopted out some of those educational animals that have been here for a long time, or even the ones that have been rehabilitating for what feels like forever and they're finally ready and they find that home. Like it, it's hard because you want to, you want to laugh and you want to cry all at the same time. Right. You know, I'm going to wait until they leave before I do that weird emotional thing where I go <laughs> <at the same> time, <laughs> you know, so, but some of, some of our larger, our larger animals work well for that educational 
program, especially because when people are looking for critters, they're not looking for something, you know, they're not looking for a 50 pound sulcata or a giant Burmese python. Right. You know, and so those ones work really well for being those educational ambassadors because they're what people want to see, but not exactly what people want to adopt. So it's perfect for that educational program. Right. And then you kind of have, you have like a rotating kind of cast and crew of them because I know you can't always have like, okay, uh, peaches, the python, the uh, speed bump, the tortoise. You're like you can't, you can't always have the same thing because just like people, they have their days. Yes, to say the least. Yes, and when we do events, we do our best to accommodate requests. So if there's some specific type, you know, some people say, "I want to see small snakes," or "We're super into tortoises," or you know, "No tarantulas," or whatnot. You know, we do our best to accommodate those requests. Right. Um, but again, we have had folks that have been like, you know, I follow your page. I'm really in love with Ricky, the Burmese. And then, you know, come to come event time and Ricky's like deep in shed and not really in a great mood. You're like, well, okay, cool. We've got princess Diana. She's a great alternative. Yep. You know, And so we do have kind of more than you would have at one event as part of our educational crew so that they can be cycled through. Yep. And then if there's any times when we have back-to-back events, that gives us a chance to be like, thanks. You did a great job. You go relax. Let's swap you out for a different tortoise. Yep, exactly. You know, so we usually have, you know, two bearded dragons on our educational team. That means that if we have two back-to-back events, we've got one bearded dragon for each. For larger events, we've got two so that more people can interact with them at a time. Mm-hmm. Or if it's in a bad mood, congratulations, you get to stay home, you know. So we do we do cycle through once we have to. Yep, that's, again, that's, you know, putting the animals, you know, putting their their well-being first while once again educating yeah. and yes and, and, it, and it works out too because you know we've got folks that have been like you know they'll schedule for someone's birthday party every year That's awesome. and they'll be like we loved you know this boa from last year can you bring her again yeah sure absolutely or they'll say you know we we want to see something a little this or we heard you got this you know and so you know sure let's bring frogs this time so we can kind of make it so that each one isn't the same, you know, eight animals. Right. It's different. And, you know, folks will go to one event and they'll be like, that was fantastic. I want to book my own now. And so maybe they were an attendee and now they want to host. Well, then we can say, you know, they were like, we love that Tegu. We really want to see him at this event too. Sweet. Awesome. Or, you know, but still make it different enough that it's entertaining and exciting right. to keep attention which means you can make it educational because we don't have their attention because they're like, I already, already, already saw this one, yep. you know? Exactly. So it gives us options. That's really cool. So um, is there a fair bit of diversity of reptiles up there? Like we, we all know that you're going to see just period, both in rescue and in not a lot of beer dragons, a lot of ball pythons, Leopard more dragon. iguanas than you'd like. Is there a decent variety of them? Um, we do get random ones where you're like, oh, okay, wasn't expecting that, but let's go for it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, we actually had to turn down a snapping turtle a few times. Oh, wow. Just because, again, you know, when we took it to the board and we had that discussion, it wasn't something that we felt that we could accommodate for a snapping turtle's entire life. And unfortunately, the market and the ability locally – for someone to be able to take that on Mm -hmm. that's the kind of animal that would come and be here for a long time yeah so you know when we had to weigh all of that it was you know we felt that it was more detrimental to the animals we could be helping to take that you know so we do see a lot of really interesting ones we've seen ones that have come in where they have let us know that they're bringing in one thing and then it turns out to be something totally different and they thought that they had a different animal that they did you know, and so you're like, oh, okay, that's not what that is, but we can still take it, you know. So, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and you, I mean, you see it on, you know, you see the corn balls all the time on Craigslist. Yeah, that's true. Oh, what that is. So we had somebody who thought they actually had four Burmese pythons, and they were ball pythons. And they were what? Ball pythons. Oh, okay. A little different. A little I different. Guess. Did he think he had dwarfs? I hope he. <laughs> No, he just didn't even know how big Burmese pythons got. So he didn't. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Okay. All right, cool. 
right. but you know that definitely affects their long-term care it's true right. yes <laughs> just a little bit so that's so funny but yeah we've seen we've seen some unique stuff we've seen some run-of-the-mill you're like okay we've got another underweight bearded dragon we've got another underweight ball python that's refusing to eat you know just some that you're just like here we go again we know how to do this we've done it before we'll do it again and yep go from there and then we've had some that are like well that's uh interesting let's see what the vet has to say about that <laughs> so. do you end up uh making a lot of trips to the vet um, our vet is actually fantastic and they're willing to work with us sometimes over the phone or communicate via email we'll share a photo mm -hmm. um, you know or help us out with dosage so that we can make sure that they get the right antibiotics um, and stuff like that so sometimes depending on the severity of the case we know that this is something that has to be treated at a vet. And then there's other times where we'll say, here's what we got in. Here's what our plan for rehabilitation. And they can say, you know, they can kind of tweak it from there um, mm -hmm. without actually having to take the animal in because they know the experience that we have and the resources that we have in order to care for them. And so they put some trust back on us too, as well. So it's, right. it's a good relationship and that, you know, we've gotten really good about being able to determine whether an animal should go see a vet versus something that we can consult with a vet versus something that we've seen and we've done a zillion times and we know that we can do. Yeah, something that essentially could be treated just from like the proper the the proper the proper temperature and humidity yeah. requirements for the species, and they'll usually kind of bounce back or, you know, oh that's a weird mass. We should probably get we an X-ray. Probably get a biopsy on that. Yep. <laughs> Or even just going so far as to, you know, just, you know, if, if there's some parasites or we need to do a fecal test or anything like that, or any concerns that, you know, we can't, maybe we're not set up to do a fecal test. Like we know this needs to go in, it needs to go in for this. And, and you know, do you provide that service? We'll take it in and get it done. Right. Um, surgeries, stuff like that. So. Makes sense. Yeah, well, damn it. So I think that's most things, but, oh, um, we touched a little bit about it um, when we were up there, but you also do a small amount of breeding, correct? Of reading? Breeding. Yes, okay. sorry. Breeding. No. I, like, yeah, I do a lot of reading. <laughs> no, not, not, not that reading, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we do a small amount of breeding. Some of our educational team members, crew, reptiles, however right. you want to call them, um we've done some breeding projects they're not a lot they're few and far between right um, but when we do we ensure that we do the breeding projects for animals that people in the lower 48 would be willing to pay shipping for mm -hmm. so not your run-of-the-mill bci or dragons or you know something that's just going to contribute to the overpopulation of a local community because that's going to be to the detriment of the rescue and again, right that's what this comes down to if a breeding project would be to the benefit of the rescue as in well these are unique enough and rare enough and we've got the genetics and we've got the bloodlines that we can do it and we can do it successfully and produce healthy animals that can be shipped out of state or even find you know occasional local homes where the animals are going to be cared for we know they're going to find homes because there's a demand for them right and the you know the financial benefit from that litter or that clutch could financially benefit the rescue then we'll do it. But again, it comes back to the animals at the rescue. Is it going to benefit them? If the yeah. answer is yes, then we'll look into it. If the answer is no, then absolutely not. <gasps> Responsible breeding. <laughs> I shouldn't joke about that. I know. I, I'm, I've seen the animals that you do, in fact, actually have breeding plans for, and I'm super jelly. Yeah, we actually just had a, one of our boas just dropped her waxy stool today, so... <gasps> The countdown has begun. Oh. Is it, uh, was it the girl that I got to play with? Um, she's the Argentine boa constrictor. Okay. So. Sweet. Yeah. That's awesome. Hopefully we'll have some updates. Fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. She's a first time mama, so. Well, she's, you know, if I remember correctly, she's good age and definitely good size, so. She's. She's definitely a good age, definitely a good size. So everything lined up perfectly for her. So I don't have any concerns, but, you know, just the, the jitters. 
Oh no, totally get it. I, I can't not get excited for that. Like I said, they're like one of my favorite animals, and so I was like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, um, I think that's kind of about it, honestly. I didn't have too too much more. Like I said, we we unfortunately talked a lot. Uh, beforehand and it doesn't all get in there but i just thought it'd be really cool to you know talk a little bit more about number one hey there's reptiles kind of everywhere you guys and not only that people doing it the right way yeah and just to kind of hear about some of like the weird stuff not only just you know the hardships of breeding or things like that but actual rescue and you know real legitimate rescue too yeah it's it's hard it's a lot of work you know, there, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't days I just wanted to throw my hands up and quit. Right. And just be like, I tried. I gave it my all, you know, but then when I think about what the needs of the community and the needs of the animals, yep. quitting's not an option. That's true. And it's, I used to say that a lot because I used to foster dogs before we got into reptiles and someone asked, why do you do this? And it's how many people get to say you legitimately contributed to saving the life of another absolutely. living thing. Absolutely. I don't know too many people who get to say that, especially all the time and lots of them and, and perpetuate education and things like that. The feeling that you can't describe to know that, I mean, even just a few months ago, there was a moment and I'm going to try not to get emotional, but there was a moment when I was just done. I was burnt out. I was exhausted. Didn't know how I was going to be able to muster the energy to do what needed to be done. And I was just so tired and, you know, frustrated. Honestly, it can be frustrating, you know, when you see these cases come in and you're like, this was avoidable, you know? And so it can be extremely frustrating. And I was just super, super burnt out. And I was cleaning and I pulled out a snake and I took a picture of her and she's been rehabilitating here since September. And I was like, you know, I'm going to look at pictures of her when she was first surrendered. And I put them side by side. And that was all the resolve I needed to be like this, this is why we do this because she was a bag of bones and mm. now she looks like she's ready to be a duck, you know, and awesome. that, because even if we didn't, you know, even if it, sometimes it feels like we're treading molasses and just trying to make progress. Sometimes you got to stop and you got to look back and be like, man, we saved that animal. That animal would not have survived. And now they're going to live and they're going to be loved and, but it's this roller coaster where 10 minutes ago you wanted to quit and now you're like, this is the coolest thing. Yep. And, you know, it's just, I wouldn't trade this for the world, but two seconds ago I wanted to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the roller coaster for sure. Well, that's, that's really cool. And I, I wish I could end on this, but I just thought of something. Um, Cause this would be a much better way to wrap that up, but I'm generally curious. Um, I know that there were talks about hopefully doing um the second reptile expo up there for um did that is that progressed at all do you think you're going to be able to we've got a location basically nailed down and a date basically nailed down okay we just need to confirm confirm a couple more things and we are ready to start advertising so that's awesome very excited about that because we had great success on the last one that we had up here and it really brought people together people are still talking about that and that was two years ago I'm hoping to make it an annual thing, but this last year, well, um, yeah, you know, you that's know, the moment. Pandemic, <laughs> um, but the reptile barn has been doing an incredible job with pulling that together. So, um, very, very excited. So, starting, starting to plan. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. On that note, Josh. Is- <laughs> Puppies, come here. You're not being very considerate. That's right. <laughs> Yay. I'm really glad I'm not the one who did it. It's always me. <laughs> it's always me. Yeah. You want to say hi? Want to say hi? Come on. Come on. Come say hi. Look. Oh. Look. Oh, there she is. There Look. she is. The furry puppy. Yeah. Because it's not always just about reptiles on the podcast. That's right. That's right. We've had a hedgehog and an owl surrendered this year. Are so with that? Do you kind of have to coordinate with like a wildlife rehabber with with like the owl and? 
Yep. Yeah, we coordinated with the local bird people. Okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of where 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 I got to where it's hey, do you know about this? And I'm like, well, maybe look at them. And then, you know, they're like, hey, I have all of these snakes. Can you help me with this? Yep. So it, it's coordinating. Right. We're here to help each other out. So it works exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's all I got for me. So um, if anybody was interested in, number one, just learning more about reptiles or if they're thinking about you know, moving up to Alaska, adopting animals. Uh, hey, I want to vend a show in Alaska because that'd be really cool. You can essentially have an entire community all to yourself. Uh, where would they go to get a hold of you? Um, you can contact us through our website, which is www.jonathansreptiles.com. Um, you can shoot us an email through that website. We've got a Facebook page, Jonathan's Reptiles. You can like there um, and donate through all those platforms as well. Uh, we've got phone number on a website and Facebook as well. So we're pretty easy to get a hold of. That's true. You were very, uh, very helpful and very open for trying to coordinate with you guys because that's, uh, it can be a little difficult sometimes with people. Not necessarily because they don't want anything to do with you just because life gets in the way. Yeah. But... Well, any, any opportunity we have to educate, we're all about. So, yes. Even if it means I have to put my face on camera. Exactly. <laughs> So thank you, thank you so much, Jonathan. I was hoping to get Josh on here just to show off his his face, but that's I okay. Know. He's uh he's busy doing stuff for the skate park in the board shop. So oh fun. Yeah, again another venture attempt to improve the community. So yeah, yeah, that's what it literally is all about. That's, that's right. So I was like, you you do that, I'll do this, and tag team it. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, hope everyone enjoyed this episode and stay tuned for more updates, more episodes and everything like that. And I'll be sure to drop the links for all of Jonathan's reptile stuff at the bottom of this podcast, as well as please go check out uh, the other YouTube video and all of their stuff too, because honestly, they do more fun stuff than I do. So hope you enjoyed it. Hope you're having a great, uh, I guess this comes out in the afternoon. So great afternoon, evening, morning, whenever you actually listen or watch this. Have a great day. Bye.